Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for taking some time out of your Saturday morning. Uh, I think this is our third or fourth one of these that we've done so far, and um, gotten a lot of really nice comments about it. Apparently, uh, most of you find this useful. We're going to continue doing this um, as we go down the road together. It's going to be, with little or no exception, it's going to be the last Saturday morning of each month. So if you want to block those out early, you probably can. Um, what I'm trying to do here is talk about markets and what's going on right now. Look at our models, see how our models are performing, explain how to use our models. Um, we've recently revamped um, several of our models. My son, Jack, uh, is now with the firm full time. And uh, Jack is, um, um, he's got his MS in, fi in, um, um, in finance and um, is effectively a quant. Uh, so I have a lot of ideas on what I think are important things to watch in the markets over my 40 plus years of doing this. And um, now I have somebody that can actually back test th those ideas. Sometimes in your mind, you've probably gone through this as investors, as you might look at an indicator or a chart and you say, I just found the holy grail. This is the world beater. But in actuality, you start back testing the, these things quantitatively and your eyes can be deceiving and your emotions can get involved and you think you found the answer. So um, having Jack here has allowed us to do a lot of uh, good things with improving our models, bringing them up to date because the market is constantly ch uh, constantly changing. The market environment is constantly changing. We went from a zero interest rate environment to, um, you know, we're knocking on the door of 5% in the 10 year, um, you know, in just a relatively short time. So you need to keep these models updated. So what I'm going to do today is first, we're going to take a look at our models, um, see how they're doing. Um, we're going to look at the Esper 6. Um, and um, take a look at that. Uh, I think uh, earlier this past week, we put out a piece talking about the Asbury 6. We changed the Asbury 6 around a little bit. Um, not a lot, but we gave it a couple of important tweaks, let's call them. And we actually did some back testing. I have people have been asking me for years, have you ever back tested the Asbury 6? Well, now we have. <laughs> so we can show you some of those um um, back test, and I think it'll give you a greater understanding on how to use the model. Then we're going to walk through a piece of this week. We just put that out this past Thursday. So it's it's still very, um, it's very germane to what's going on in the market. Now there's a lot of charts there to look at. So we're going to go through that uh, kind of chart by chart, maybe give you a better understanding of the metrics we use. And why they're and why they're important now, and why we chose these ten as the most important ten right now. Um, finally, we're going to just <clears throat> we're going to go through the CIF table, very uh, the CIF model very quickly. And um, aside from the CIF overlay, which gives us the signals, we just updated that this morning, by the way. So we have technology and energy are the two overlay signals, but there's a lot more information. That is in the model itself. Um, and Jack actually is going to start, I don't know if it's going to be this week or next week, but he's going to start to produce a video that'll be in the keys to this week for market sectors and industry groups, which is usually at the beginning of the week. And it will go through the CIF model <clears throat> and kind of explain you some of the nuances and show you like this week, uh, just this past week, real estate. Um, was the best um, in terms of assets in over this past week. Sometimes looking at the model, um, kind of aside from the overlay, which is our simple way of giving you the signals that are back tested, there's a lot more information in there that I think that you can use as traders and investors. Um, so I'm going to take a brief look at that. Again, I want to let you know that's a new feature we're adding, um, you know, Jack's video. Uh, uh, that should be Within the next couple of weeks, uh, that's something you're going to see as a regular feature of Keys to This Week uh, for sectors and industry groups. And then finally, we're going to look at some live charts. Uh, we save that for the end. It seems that uh, those of you that have been with me for a real, um, you know, for a long time and haven't just joined over the past, you know, few months with us, um, it's a favorite. So let's begin 
and we're going to do a quick update of the models. I think the important thing with these models is that people understand what they're for. They're not a magic lamp that you rub and a guy comes out and hands your bag of money. They're certainly not that. What they are meant to do is participate in the markets with the same or, or less risk than the S&P 500. So your drawdowns are smaller, your beta is smaller, your standard deviation is less, and still be able to you know, show some good results. So here is, um, let's begin with CPM from the beginning of the year. CPM plus, by the way, is the newly, um, um, what would I say, <laughs> revamped. Uh, CPM is now six indicators. It used to be three. It's much more robust. We've changed some of the indicators around and we have much better performance. So here's from 2023. You can see this is just this year. CPM plus is in green. The S&P 500 is in blue. So you can see we're underperforming by about 0.8% um, for the year. Um, but again, we're doing that. I don't have the slides with you, but you can uh, with me, but you can go to the website, go to asburyresearch.com and go to models. And you can say that see that this was achieved with half the beta, um, half the drawdown um, as the S&P 500, much less standard deviation, much better sharp ratio. If you don't understand any of these terms, you can go to investopedia.com or you can contact us and we'll send them to you. But basically staying right with the S&P 500 stuck like glue to it, but with a lot less risk. So now let's go back to CPM plus and look at historically, uh, cause that was, you know, that is what matters. We're not day traders here. So we're much interested, much more interested in how it's done historically. Uh, so now you can see this goes back uh, to 2017. So we've got five years here with CPM and what this is showing, I'm just moving a couple of windows out of the way here so I can see my own chart better. You can see that CPM, um, has again stuck with the S&P 500 like glue um, since 2017 and currently during that period um, it's outperforming the S&P by about 10 percent 64.8 65 versus 75.6 so anytime that you could stay close to the S&P 500 with half the risk it's a big deal to me that's really a hard thing to do because there's a very much a push me pull you with um, the more you, uh, if somebody comes and tells you we beat the S&P by 30%, how much did they risk? You know, let's see what their drawdowns look like after five or 10 years. So this is a way for older, more risk averse investors to be able to play the game with similar results with less risk. Let's look at CIF. CIF for the year let me make sure I get the same the, the correct chart here. Here is CIF. Okay, this is CIF since 2023. <laughs> so we are trailing the S&P 500 by about 6% right now um, in CIF. But keep in mind, through last quarter, uh, CIF has outperformed the S&P in 10 of the past 13 quarters. It's not going to outperform all the time. Um, what's happening a lot this year is the money is jumping around from sector to sector very, uh, very fast. So you're not getting this opportunity to jump on a, a two quarter trend of outperformance by any sector and stick with it because the money is churning. But if we go back to see since inception, which is, this looks like inception here, it is. So here's inception for Seif. So basically in the middle of 2020, 13 quarters back, you can see that Seif started to pull away from uh, the S&P 500 right here. This is actually November-ish of 20, um, actually this is uh, the early part of 2021. When I was thinking of November it was right here. If you can see my mouse move, that's when Seif switched to an overweight in both energy and financials and rolled those all the way up until the middle of the, you know, the next year, which was 2021. We caught a nice lead here, 
We didn't give up as much on the downside during 2022. I think CFA performed by uh, 12% during um, 2022. And now this year it's lagging a little bit, but it's still 73.3% versus 45.5% during that 13 week period. So again, keep it in perspective. It's not gonna make money every month. I, frankly, I'm very surprised and pleased that it's outperformed 10 of the past 13, but that's a look at how our models are doing. The next thing I wanna do, and I'm gonna switch screens on you again, is we're going to have a look at the Asbury 6. I wanna make sure people understand what we did there, and here we go. So if you wanna follow this at home, or if you wanna find this after, um, after we're through today, you go to the Research Center, and then you just scroll down all of these individual reports are listed in time order, in chronological order here. So you go down a few here. I think it's the fourth one, fifth one down here. Special report, updated Asbury 6 model. So the reason we did this, for one, we have a lot more horsepower, obviously, with Jack being here and us being able to test um, ideas at the drop of a hat. I've had so many people ask me over the years, um, how do we trade the... Asbury 6, is the Asbury 6 a model? Do you have any performance on the Asbury 6? And these six started out because 10 years ago, the models were a lot, uh, the markets were easier to trade, they're easier to understand. Now the s and is up 50 today, we've seen it this past week. It's up 40 in the morning and down 40 at night. It forces people, even guys like me that have been doing this all their lives to make mistakes. You get scared out of a good idea, or you get sucked into buying a market that is still technically weak and instantly it takes you out and you lose money. So I built something with the best tactical tools that I've learned throughout my career, put them all together so I don't get faked out. I kept it internally for years and then it dawned on me I should be showing this to my clients, I should be showing this to our subscribers that's what the Asbury 6 is. We made a few changes to it to make it a little bit sharper. We basically sharpened the pencil. So there are six metrics here. There's market breadth, there's volume, there's relative performance, asset flows that are moving in and out of the SPY, the SPIDER, the S&P 500 ETF, volatility via the VIX, and price rate of change. And... Um, the primary purpose of the A6 is to provide an objective data-driven methodology to determine how much capital investors should be deploying into the stock market. It's another question I get all the time from both our money manager clientele. We have RIAs and you know commodity trading advisors, uh, all different kinds of portfolio managers. And we have a lot of individual investors that go from very sophisticated people that used to be in the financial business when they were working to, you know, moms and dads and grandfathers that are just trying to understand the markets because there's too much show business on, you know, in the financial markets, especially on TV to really get any knowledge from there. So the question I get is, how much should I be invested right now? We're testing support. How much should I be invested? A great question. Um, a6 answers that question, um, especially after we've done our back test. That's precisely what the A6 does. So right now, the A6 is all red. What does that mean? It means that one day the market's going to make a bottom, but betting on that bottom right now is a bad bet because all six of those individual components that are telling me what the internal strength of the market is are telling me that it's weak. Here's some of the back testing stuff. <clears throat> this was really interesting to me. I'm really happy how this turned out. Since 2018, which is five years ago, um, and you might say, well, the other ones went back 10 or 12 years. Why don't you go back farther? Because as markets change, as interest rate policy changes, as the way the markets are traded, how much computerized trading is going on, what's going on um, you know, geopolitically, there's so many different things that change the landscape, change the environment. Ray Dalio, um, you know, believes um, every five to seven years, your model should be shifting to change with. So, I mean, you know, I've been doing this 40 years. I learn something every day. What I've learned is you need to keep your models more current because 
what happened 12 years ago when we were in a zero interest rate environment and you know, coming out of the financial crisis is a different environment than we're in now. So that's why, if you're wondering, why'd you only go back to 2018? That's why. So here's the Asbury 6. And the way we back tested this was we back tested it with a hypothetical $100,000 account. And each one of the six is one sixth of that. So <clears throat> basically 13 point something percent six times, or uh, a, 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 I'm sorry, 16.3 or whatever it might be. in six equal segments. So right now we're zero invested because all six are negative. When one comes on, one sixth of that $100,000 portfolio gets put into the market and we use SPY for that, the S&P 500 ETF. Two is two six, three is three six, four is four six. And I know that most people aren't going to want to be that active and keep on changing their allocation is the Asbury 6 is kind of ebbing and flowing from 6 green to 6 red. But we thought it was the most honest and clear way to back test this as a viable way to determine what the internal strength of the market is. So here's A6 and here's SPX. Here's the big takeaway. This was the COVID collapse. Look what happened in the S&P. It just got destroyed here. A6 had us out. Um, long, you know, maybe a third to 40% of the way down, and we avoided all this. So when, so once the market started moving higher again, we had a lead off, so to speak. The A6 had a, had a bit of a lead off. 2021 was a um, sort of a difficult market for models because that's when Powell came out and said, we are not going to let financial assets deteriorate. In other words, free money, everybody in the pool, and you can see during 2021, we had this nice, steady, um, safe move up. And every time there was a wiggle in the A6, it started started taking some money out of the market. But the market didn't care because Powell said it was free money day and um, a free money year, I guess, right? But bottom line here, um, it's within, what do we have, 55 points? That, it's within two and a half, three percent of the S&P 500 for that whole period. And... Here's the quantitative metrics that go with that. So S&P, um, since 2018, um, it's up um, 9.14% annualized versus 8.77 annualized. So really close. But look at these numbers. Maximum drawdown, only 14.6, less than half of the 33.9 for the S&P. <laughs> Standard deviation almost half, 10.9 standard deviation. And again, if you don't understand these terms, please go to investopedia.com. Great website, pictures, videos. I'm actually going to be doing, Asbury will be doing a guest, um, you know, uh, a guest week um, there on Monday. So they're, uh, or I'm sorry, on, in sometime the first or second week of January. So they're friends of ours. This is great. You know, I use this for my glossary for all of our customers. So standard deviation is another way of determining risk in the market. Uh, almost half. Beta, most people understand what beta is, almost exactly half. Um, so the Asbury 6, just as an indicator, which is what it is, it's an indicator to tell you the true health of the market. Um, it's giving you the market over the past five years with half the risk. So again, uh, a lot of this credit goes to Jack, uh, my son, who was able to take the knowledge that I've acquired over 40 years and quantify it. I mean, uh, really tear it up and see what's real. These are real numbers on a very, very good metric to tell you day to day, should I be adding or should I be subtracting risk from my portfolio? So that's the Asbury 6. The next thing I wanted to do, I'm going to stay in the research center. And I wanted to give folks a assessment of what's going on in the market right now. And I thought the best way to do this is to use Keys to This Week. Um, we're thinking about actually adding a video to Keys to This Week. So if you have any thoughts on that, but that's basically what this is going to be this morning. So this was done. We published this late in the day on Thursday. So it's pretty current. Um, so <clears throat> keys to this week used to be out at the beginning of the week, um, months back. We changed that because we do the weekly wrap up on Saturday. You'll be seeing one either you know later today or tomorrow, sometime during the weekend. 
which kind of gives you an idea of what to expect going into the beginning of the week. So rather the redundancy of putting keys out right out on Monday or Tuesday, we're waiting for the market to move a little bit, you know, off of the weekend and waiting for it to kind of establish something as it did this week, it started falling apart you know, towards the end of the week. So that's that's what determines when keys is out. So it's not, well, John must be busy. No, I'm waiting for the market to kind of start giving me, start to you know tilt its head one way or the other, giving me a sense of where it's going. I could do a much better report for you that he has more current information. <clears throat> so CPM plus, which we looked at is risk off as of October the 25th. If you read anything during the week, and I know people don't like to read, um, uh, you know, tons of stuff, right? People want videos, people want pictures, it's a fast world. So it's a more different, um, you know, world than it might've been 20 years ago, but read the conclusion investment implications and strategy of the keys to this week report, whenever you get it. Um, it's a few paragraphs, it's five minute read tops. Um, and it will really give you an idea strategically what I'm thinking. And not only this indicator is doing this and th uh, this indicator is doing that, but <clears throat> I looked at 200 charts, a bunch of our, old, our own models. This is where I think things are going. Down at the bottom, we talk about size, which is large, medium, or small. We talk about style, which is growth or value. We talk about um, sector rotation via our CIF model where the money's going, and we talk about the U.S. versus the world model, where the money is going internationally. Right now, the U.S. is pretty much leading the field, but we're starting to see some positive uh, performance coming from the Asia-Pacific region. I really pay attention when these things are regional, they're geographical, and that we got Italy here uh, and Chile here um, and um, you know something else uh, if everything starts to concentrate geographically, that tend to be where the best signals are. And right now, it's the Asia Pacific region. Then we get down to this little graphic here. And all I do is I take the 10, which we're going to go through, um, the 10 keys to this week, and I classify them. Are they tactically positive or negative, which is these two right here up top? Are they strategically positive or negative? And <clears throat> I kept this in-house for a long time. This was my little tool. I had a bunch of these printed up on a notepad. So, you know, you look at 10, 20 indicators and you're starting to forget where the numbers are in terms of which ones are positive or which ones are negative and for what time frame. So I use this as a tool for myself to kind of see where the evidence was going. And right now, very, very simply, most of the activity is in the negative tactical box. Let's call it a quadrant, the negative quadrant here for tactical. Just as a review, when Asbury Research says tactical, that is monthly for us or 21 business days. When we talk about strategic, strategic is a quarter or more. And a quarter for us is 63 business days. So whether you're doing your own analysis or you're getting it from us, Make sure you know what time frame that you're using for your various tools. We know what's tactical for us and we know what's strategic. It allows us to come up with a sharper picture. Right now, the weight of evidence in, in the quadrant here is towards negative tactical. So let's look at these individually. This support and resistance uh, table, you're going to get an updated uh, version of this uh, this weekend for weekly wrap up. But this basically shows us where we are. Back in July, I was we were stating at Asbury here that it seemed very unlikely that we're, we were going to get through 4637 because there was too many strategic indicators that indicated the market was overstretched. It was. It peaked on July the 27th. I think our A6 went negative on August the 4th, a few days later, five days later, whatever it was. In the meantime, it formulated this pattern. This is a head and shoulders pattern. I don't pay as much attention to these as, as I used to 10 or 20 years ago, because I believe that the algo, the um, algorithmic traders um, oftentimes use these patterns to kind of get us to lean 
us as investors to lean to one side of the market and then they take it away. So I was really skeptical about looking at this until recently, but basically this pattern targets a move down to 4,100. Um, so the S&P came down, it stopped at this major support level that I've been talking about probably to many of you ad nauseum for months, 4,200. We've got the trend line from the October 22 low here, um, solid green line. We've got the February peak and also the May peak um, at, here at 41.95. And then we had the 200 day moving average, which is a major trend proxy here at 42.40. Um, you could see, tested it. We came right up to the 50 day moving average, which is the minor trend proxy. Right now it's at 43.72, you're in blue. And then we collapse down through here. That is a failed attempt to hold the trend line and it is bearish. You can see it in the Esbury 6, you can see it in CPM plus. Uh, so 4,100 is the next target. Where's the resistance right now? Very near term. I think it's the 200 day moving average at 4,240. Where's the bigger resistance? It's up here at 4,372. In other words, we'd have to get back up through 4,372 to suggest to me <clears throat> that the previous uptrend is resuming Got a long way to worry about that. So let's worry about kind of what's underneath right now. So 4,100 is a target. A lot of people look at this type of analysis. So you may see some profit taking at 4,100 because it's a big round number. And because people that have read a third of a book on technical analysis are going to know what this pattern is. The bigger levels to pay attention to is we've got these lows here uh, from April and May at 40.49. And then the next level is the March 13th low at 38.09. So that's what to watch for now. That's kind of how the game board lays out. If you're looking at, all right, I took some money out, you know, where do I want to take money? Or I love this market. I think, I think the market is too weak. I want to start to put on, um, I mean, even if the Esbury 6 isn't, you know, totally green, I want to start to buy stuff on this break. 4049 if we get there, 3809 if we get there. Those are really obvious levels that somebody might consider putting their toe in the water, so to speak, even though we are now what looks like an emerging major downtrend. Oh, one little fact to throw out there to you. Um, I don't have the exact numbers here. I'm sure you can find it on the internet. That's where I found it. There's only been of the past 18 major downtrends. Um, the S&P 500 was positive or down years of the past 18, I think 18 years going back in history that the S&P was down for the year. Only in two of those was it down in the next year, the subsequent year, the other ones it was up. So history tells us the likelihood of us having a rebound between now and the end of the year. Historically, it's very unlikely to go back to back on two. So, you know, for whatever that's worth, I, I, I would never trade five cents on that kind of a thing, but it's good to know. So let's look, let's try to work through a few more of these. <clears throat> we're, we're about 32 minutes in now. This is a big chart for me, and I've been looking at it for a long time. This is the Russell 2000 small cap index weekly. It goes back to 2018. Uh, all the support in here, effectively from the uh, August 2018 and June of 2020 lows at 1742 to 1715, it was hit six times here last year. I was shocked that it was able to hold. Well, guess what? Now we're testing those, those low levels here at 1641. We actually closed through it by a smidge on, on um, Friday. Not enough to really confirm any kind of a breakdown, but it is starting to get through here. The reason I'm really concerned about that, we know that small cap has been underperforming all year, but I checked it earlier this week, the linear correlation, we use a, a Pearson coefficient for that, the linear correlation between RUT and SPX, which is the symbol for the S&P 500, tight and stable positive correlation going back 20 years, various time periods, 10 years, five years, three years, one month, three months. So if we break down through 1641 in a sustainable sustainable way, there is no support here for hundreds of points. That really 
it makes me nervous. So what's 1641? We start trading underneath 1641. I'm going to be watching to see if the Russell is going to lead the S&P into a deeper decline. So something to keep an eye on, 1641 and RUT. Next, market internals. Right now, all six are, are red um, or negative um, in the Esbury 6. Here's volatility, the VIX. This is maybe the best day-to-day -day tactical indicator that I know of, at least right now. When the VIX is above its 21-day moving average, Y21, that's Asbury's tactical time period. When it's above the 21-day moving average, the market either goes sideways or down. So here's basically September 20. It's just kind of eyeballing it up here. And you can see we came down and started to break through there right when it was struggling to get through the 50-day moving average, the S&P up on top here. I don't have the 50 drawn in, but it was right basically in here. Failed, it went back down. That 21-day moving average is currently at 1865. Unless that is broken, and not for a half an hour on a Thursday afternoon, but if that is sustainably broken, that's some kind of a near-term bottom in the market. Until then, you're trying to catch a falling knife. So watch the VIX, watch the 21-day moving average. If it's above it, um, the market investors are still too afraid to go out on a limb and buy stocks. Here's market breath. <clears throat> this is um, one of two indicators that we're going to look at today that make me believe that we are... I don't expect an enormous move down here that's going to take us through the end of the year. Again, the Asbury 6 and the CPM are going to tell me when. Those are my go-tos. I don't like to be a forecaster. I'm not the amazing Kreskin. I can't see the future. Fortunately, nobody else can either. So I make my determination on what might happen, and then I wait to look at the VIX or the A6 or the CPM to tell me when it's time. But this is a percentage of NYSE stocks trading above the 40-day moving average. You can see it's down underneath 33%. It's been down there really since the beginning of October. It was down there on March the 23rd. That was a nice bottom in the S&P. Down there again on September 26th. We had our bottom on October 13th. A couple of weeks later, three, four weeks later. And then right at June 16th of last year. What does this tell me? This tells me we're pro unless we go into some kind of huge event, COVID was a huge event. It was a, a global event. Um, unless we go through some kind of a um, uh, extraordinary event, you know, like COVID was, this should find us a bottom here within the next few weeks or so. So keep that in mind. Um, Investor sentiment. <laughs> this is a variation of Jake Bernstein's daily sentiment index or DSI. When I started out as a kid on the trading floor in the early 1980s, Jake Bernstein was one of the most respected futures technicians out there. Um, he's about 20 years or so older than me. He's still actually producing stuff. Really smart guy, really good guy. Um, but this basically is our spin on his indicator, which is a daily survey of futures trader bullishness on the S&P 500. When, they are, um, when these near to intermediate term trend following futures traders are least bullish, oftentimes it's in or around some kind of a bottom as it was at the end of December, as it was in June of 2019, March of 2020 at the COVID lows, but you see, sometimes if the market's really bearish, as it was during the major downturn last year, this metric can stay at at least bullish retail investor reading um, of 17 or under for an extended period of time. Right now, we are not there, but we are quickly accelerating towards there. That suggests to me this next one or two weeks here could be rough. So um, that's something else I think is important to watch right now. Seasonality is a, a very important to watch. The, this is quarterly seasonality in the S&P 500 based on data from 1957. Why 57, John? 57, March of 57 is when the S&P 500 
evolved out of its previous iteration, which was called the S&P uh, Composite Index that originated back in I don't know, 1917 or something like that. So that's when we go back to 57. This is the 13 weeks of the fourth quarter um, seasonally based on data from 57. You can see the first, second, and third um, strongest weeks of the entire um, fourth quarter are the first two and the last weeks of November. Then we have more strength here, Santa Claus rally here at the very end. But November, generally speaking, is a, a strong month. It's the strongest month. It's the strongest month of the year. Um, in the S&P 500 based on these same data. So sometime in November, it's very feasible that we can have some kind of a market bottom in here. But again, unless you see it in the VIX, unless you see it in the CPM, unless you see it at least in the Asbury 6 starting to turn green, it's too soon to try to catch the falling knife. Um, U.S. interest rates is enormously important right now. I don't know if you remember, but last year, those of you who were with me last year, I was talking about 425 as being the peak in the yield of the 10-year that went all the way back to um, 08, um, June of 08 to be exact, and said that if we, if the if these yields could not break this 425 level and started moving back towards 4% and into the threes, that could be a catalyst to fuel a stock market rally. The stock market bottomed on October 3rd, 13th of last year, and it's taken off as a shot. We may have another um, situation like that here. Uh, these yields are right underneath 5%. 5% is a big fat number that the market likes. And right above there is 5.23%, which are the peaks going back to June of 06 and July of 07. So <clears throat> I doubt, uh, let's put it this way. It's highly unlikely historically, at least in my experience, for these yields to blow through this 5% to 5.23 area without some kind of a move down first. So what does that mean in terms of your investment? It means if you see bond yields start to reverse from here and it coincides with a move down in the VIX, the A6 is starting to turn green, that could be a really great place for a multi-quarter buying opportunity in the S&P 500 because this is so formidable. The other part is, if you haven't done so already, because this 5.23 area is likely to, I anything's possible. I've been doing this long enough to know that anything's possible, but likely this will be a peak in the yield of the 10-year you know, for quarters to come. So that means if you got a chance to buy some CDs, if you got a chance to buy some fixed income money or you know some fixed income assets, CDs or T-bills or whatever, you know something on the short end, I you know I would suppose that's where the yields are right now. This is a very good time to do this where you might not see these yields again for a long time. So let's um and this is just you know basically the outperformance, this is straight from the CART model, right? The only two places that in the CART model that have been giving us signals for most of the year is to be in large cap rather than medium or small cap and to be in growth rather than value. See, growth as SPY G has outperformed SPY by as much as 6% up until August 15th, we've, gave, we've given back about a percent. So it's outperformed by about 5%. So it's always, especially if you're a manager, and you can't go to cash, you can maybe go to 20% cash and that's it. The CART model can really help you show where the outperformance is. So if the market is down 16% that year and you're down 10, your clients are happy with you. Um, you know, they understand that you have to be invested and you were able to be in the right place at the right time. So that's our little walk through keys. I thought that might be a really good way for me to explain how to interpret keys and what to what to be paying attention to. Um, the next thing I'm just going to do real quick is we're going to walk through we're going to walk through the model. So we went through the Asbury Six. Uh, we went through CPM. Here's U.S. versus the world really quickly. <clears throat> and 
I just want to spend a minute here. So these are 25 foreign equity markets. They are clumped or grouped in geographic areas, like you have South America here. Um, you have Asia Pacific down here. You have Western Europe here. Um, so what I look for, what's the most important to me is if I see out, so right now the first, okay, let me back up a step. This is trading, which is five days. This is tactical and this is strategic. It's measuring if each of these 25, if they're outperforming SPY on any of these time periods through the closing date, which is the end of business. Now this is last week. We haven't updated this yet for the upcoming week, but you can see we got an outlier here with Brazil, but then we have three from the Asia Pacific region. We have Malaysia, Taiwan, and India outperforming all at the same time. So two takeaways. One, it's not a great time to be investing, taking money out of the US and putting it here, at least not yet, because you see a lot of white here. When you see white, it means the US or SPY is outperforming these various countries and all these various frames of time. But right here, Malaysia, Taiwan, and India. So that tells me as an investor, that's what I want to be keeping my eye on. Um, am I invested in any of these right now? No, because we're just broke through 4,200 in the S&P and I wasn't going to start allocating into another country while we're at a major support level in the S&P 500. But that's how you look at this. Look for geographical clusters of green bolded and that will show you where the opportunities are. Last year, in the first four months of the year, Chile, Brazil and Peru all outperformed by a ridiculous amount, like 20%. And then in the last three or four months of last year, you had um, Italy, Spain, France, uh, UK, all outperformed by a large amount, 10% or more. So there are times when this model is a very good tool where you can take some of that sideline money while the A6 is red and while CPM is risk off, and you could put it into these geographic areas and maybe capture some relative outperformance while you're waiting for the sun to come out again in the US. Um, let's get back to the research center and um, sector and industry group ideas. Just go through these. These are trades. These are not investments. These are trades. We have a, um, a methodology that we use to um, be able to determine where the opportunity is. We look at three things. We look at about 100 ETFs that include sectors, industry groups, and various commodities, uh, 40 different types of commodities from gold to solar. And we look for three things. We wanna see a positive major trend, meaning that ETF is trading above its 200 day moving average. Number two, we want to see that sector outperforming the S&P 500 on a quarterly basis, 63-day basis. That is number two. Number three, we want to see the AUM, which is shares outstanding multiplied by NAV daily. We want to see those that AUM above its 21-day moving average. So major trend outperforming the S&P on a quarterly basis and asset expansion on a monthly basis, then that scan, it gives us a short list. And then I look at those and I see if I can put any of those ideas on um, for a relatively low risk with a more open-ended upside. So <clears throat> since March of last year, I, don't know, I think we're about somewhere around 65, 60% of these um, are profitable. And the average winning trade is about one and a half to two, about one and a half, maybe 2%, somewhere in there, more than the average loss. So that's what we're looking for, um, is we're looking to be profitable on most of our trades, have small losers and bigger winners. Right now, the only one that we're in right now is gold. We're going to look at a chart of gold um, in just a little bit. So we're going to look at gold as the only one that we have uh Left right now, we bought it on 1019. We moved our stop. If you see back, to kind of explain an easier way to look at this. So you open up the research center in the morning, you see what the A6 is doing. Look at the date here. 
October 28th is today. So we just changed something. What do we change? You got to look for the yellow highlight. All we did here was we moved our stop up to 179.75. We moved it up for, by two, three bucks. Um, heading into next week, um, it's up 2% and it's outperformed the S&P by six. So we'll see where that goes. But that I just wanted to kind of explain to you functionally um, uh, what that's for. These are trades. Uh, <clears throat> we do not sit on big losses there. We move our stops quickly. Uh, some of our clients, not most of them, but some of them, they like these individual ideas. We don't do individual stocks anymore because just the volatility for individual investors is um, kind of atrocious. If you get caught in front of a, you know, look at Tesla or look at Microsoft. If you get caught in front of a, uh, um, in front of an earnings report, you know, you could lose six, 7% before you even get out of bed. So we keep it within the ETF um, sphere. It, it, tamps down the volatility a little bit. We talked about CARP and US versus the world. So um, one quick thing about CIF, I just wanted to talk to you. So we have the CIF model and then we have the overlay. The overlay is here. These are where the signals are. This is what was back tested. This is what pertains to the chart that I showed you at the very beginning. This is gonna be recorded by the way. So we will send the recording link out to everybody, if you do not get one for whatever reason, maybe your uh, email server hit a hiccup or whatever it might be, ask us, this is gonna be available for you. Uh, but these are the signals. So we got out of communication services at the end of last week. We're still overweight energy and technology, but there's a lot more going on in this table than just that. This is that video that we're going to put out there by the way, let us know if you like it, if you think it's a good idea. We learn a lot from you in terms of what you're looking for and how we could help you the best. But look at what happened with uh, communication services. Communication services is still third in terms of assets in on the CIF model on tactical and third on strategic. But look what happened here. It, it was a fire drill. Everyone out of XLC last week that's why we got out in the middle of the week. We saw that money was running out of there like there was a fire in the building and we didn't want to be involved in that. So other interesting things, look at utilities. It was the in the strategic, it was one of the two most aggressive with assets out over the past 63 days, but it's number one in terms of assets in um, this past week. Why? defensive. Everyone's afraid. So we're moving into stuff like utilities. And look at real estate. This is kind of a sleeper here. So this is kind of what this is going to do. Jack's going to point out these different relationships, how they equate to what's going on in the news, how, um, how uh, you know, what's happening in the economy. Oh, real estate has been down on the bottom here for months and months and months and months. This week, we're number two in terms of trading. So this is where the money was going, um, first in utilities and second in real estate. And we're even starting to come out of the doldrums here. Is it a signal yet, um, according to the over, overlay? No, why? Because it's not here um, on this um, box, um, on this shaded box, let's call it. There's a reason the shaded box is up higher in a hierarchy on the report than the model itself, because this is where the signals are that correspond to the charts that we showed you. But <clears throat> again, just I want to take a few minutes there. Um, make sure you understand CIF, that there's more to CIF. Um, if you're somebody that likes to buy individual stocks, a great way to use this tool outside of the overlay, which again is a shaded box, is to look and see what's favored. Favored is between three and 15. So you've got energy, technology, and real estate. So that means if you're a fundamental analyst, if you have ideas on the economy, if you have your own technical tool that might be Fibonacci numbers or trend lines or whatever you use, a good way to do this is see what's favored. That's where the money's going. You've got wind at your back in those three sectors. So what you do is you go to your charting program, whether you use Fidelity's program, or <clears throat> stock charts, which I do a lot of work for, or TC2000, doesn't matter. Go to that sector, sort by market cap, biggest market cap, the biggest stops 
stocks on top and go to the um, top 20 in each of those sectors and look for those setups that you like. Maybe you read something in the paper or you were on an earnings call or whatever it might be. There's a million different things, but by just maybe taking the top 10 or 20 or whatever your number is on each of these in terms of market cap, each of the seat favorite sectors, it's going to help you to buy sectors that have your setup whether it's economic or fundamental or whatever it might be, but those are the places that have that have the wind at your uh, your back. So it's going to give you a little bit of an edge in picking better stocks where you're buying sectors where the money is going into. So the last thing that I want to do here is I've got a short list. We're going to switch our screen up again real quick. And we have a question. <laughs> good. It's a good time to do that. Okay. Can you share some of the factors that drive the CPM plus to be risk on or risk off? Yes, um, there are three. I'm going to direct you to something here. Um, let's um, let's go back here for just a moment. And I'm going to probably run over just a few minutes. So I understand everybody's busy, but <clears throat> the best way you should be able to see my screen again Um so scroll down to where is that? Um, our CPM model. So you're going to go to special reports and Asbury Alerts here on the side. And We're going to go to September the 29th, introducing CPM Plus, our updated correction protection model. So I would read this. Um, so there are six features in here. Um, it's it's a bit of a secret sauce, um, but there are there are six. I'm actually going to another computer here um, in the office, so bear with me. There are three different class of, uh, classifications of indicators that we use. One is relative performance. There's some relative performance indicators there. This against that. How good is the S and how's the S and P doing against bonds, or how's the S and P doing against the Qs or whatever? It's it's relative performance. There is another factor that has to do with asset flows. <laughs> Asset flows that are going into certain ETFs that we find to be very revealing. Our back testing has found to be very um, influential in terms of what the direction of the market is going. And the third one, the third one is standard deviation. Um, standard deviation is basically how we use standard deviation is how far has the market deviated from its norm. We're actually going to look at one way to look at standard deviation in this final few minutes that I'm going to have here. But there's six metrics, and those three categories that I just mentioned are the categories that they that they're in. So let's do a new share here. And I just people seem to like this. This um at the end, just kind of freestyle. I'm just going through some charts that I think are particularly important to look at, um, you know, right now, here's gold. This is gold daily. And um, let's move this out of the way. So this is gold daily. This is July of, uh, of last year. So a little bit more than a year. So gold actually broke this trend line. This is actually, if you're wondering what this Jeff Jeff Mick is their Jeff MC. This is one of our money manager clients um, um, who um, is very interested in gold. And he asked me to tell him where there was opportunities in gold or asked us. So, um, you know, we told him to buy gold here. I don't know, we get out somewhere in here. And then we just told him that this was the opportune area to buy gold again. Here, gold is moving higher. It broke through this little resistance. This is GLD, by the way, the ETF for gold bullion. Um, it's the most popular traded gold ETF. So the next target here, we finished last week at 186.15. 
Uh, next target is right here, about 191. This is based on the peak that we made back in May. And then after that, <clears throat> we have more resistance up here around 194. So 191 to 194 is where I think we're going. If we get through here, blue sky, uh, we have a lot more room to go. So while the S&P 500 is getting beaten up right now, Gold is outperforming. It's moving higher. We're looking at more potential opportunities in the commodity space that we can put out there while the stock market is trying to regain its footing. Here's IWM. And we looked at IWM. And you can see that on a live chart here. If we break down through here in IWM, we really have nothing in terms of support you know, for hundreds of points. So watch, um, so watch that. SPY. This is um, JNK is the um, is one of several um, ETFs that track the price of high yield bonds, high yield corporate bonds. So when the stock market, so here's JNK down here is its relative performance versus the S and P 500. So what we have found is when the S and P or SPY is outperforming junk. Stock prices are outperforming high yield bond prices. High yield corporate bonds, by the way, they act much more like a stock than they do a bond. But when high yield corporate bond prices are outperforming stock prices, as we've had since right here, you can see this right here. Uh, this is my own little circle here, you know, that I stuck here earlier in the week. But basically, since it's called the middle of September, um, even though these prices are going down. In J and K, they're going down slower than the S and P. This is our performance by junk over spy. That's what typically happens in a weak market. Until this changes, this relationship is telling me the market is weak and vulnerable to more losses. Here's um, standard deviation. <clears throat> this is standard. This is one of a a lot of different ways I'm sure to look at standard deviation, <clears throat> but this is the percent of NYSC stocks that are trading one standard de uh, deviation below their 40-day moving average. And right now, it's about 64%. It's a lot historically. You can see we got to about 64% here back in March of this year. That ended up developing into a good bottom in the S&P 500. This is se late September of 22. You can see we got up here, came back down. We came and retested it a second time, kind of like how we're doing now. That was the October low. That was right there. That was the October 13th low of last year. Here's another one from back in June of 22 and so on. So I mentioned earlier that even though the market looks horrible now and I wouldn't touch it with the 10 foot pole right now, this tells me that we might be a few within a few weeks or so, especially based on the seasonality in November of some kind of a important bottom starting to emerge in the S and P 500. That other metric, that breadth metric we looked at, the percentage of NYSE stocks, um, it was in keys. You can see it um, after we're, you know we're through here. You can go back to the research center, um, but it shows up in that. Um, percentage of NYSC stocks trading below their um, trading above the 40 day moving average, it shows up there as well. So a couple of metrics. That, so this metric just simply says we're overextended according to standard deviation. And unless something, um, you know, COVID like or escalation in the war, or we default on our loans, you know, something that would be um, out of the norm, somewhere over the next few weeks or so, historically, and again, history doesn't have to repeat, but it usually does. Within the next few weeks, we may get an opportunity to really have a good buying opportunity as we get into that, you know, seasonal kind of, you know, push that we have into January. Um, we already looked at the 10-year. We already looked at the VIX. Um, there are some support levels that I think you should keep an eye on next week. Uh, and one is Apple. Apple is starting to break down through its 200 day moving average after holding it here at the end of September. Apple's very influential. Apple is trying to get above its 60. This is relative performance here of Apple versus SPY down here in the lower panel. 
you can see it's kind of hugging its 63-day moving average. If this rolls back underneath it and we continue to stay under the 200-day moving average, Apple obviously has a lot of sway in the market. It's number one according to market cap. That's something to be aware of. Also be aware of the NDX, which is a NASDAQ 100. It is also testing its 200-day moving average. And then underneath there, it is testing its, this line is really irrelevant here. It is testing its uh, peak from August of last year. So this little box here, so watch, so watch the NASDAQ support. Apple is obviously a big cap tech. So those two tie in together. Um, and then finally, SOX index is semiconductors. SOX is testing this big support level here that entails its 200 day moving average, its peak from back in March, and even a older peak that goes back to May of 22. So <clears throat> we're five minutes over, we're about 64, 65 minutes here. I'm gonna stop screen sharing. Um, and um, thank you all for attending. Please let us know how we did. This is your hour. Um, I think being able to actually talk to you once a month, take some questions. Um, I, I hope it helps you to use our tools better. It lets me be more useful to you. So Audrey, if there's anybody that has anything they'd like to ask or comment on, I'd love to take those now.